thank you. So, <laughs> that was it. That was it. It was just more more low key than, yeah. Oh man. Well, yeah. It's so awesome to to be here with you guys again on this Tuesday morning and. Just knowing that God's mercies are new every single day, and uh, we have breath in our lungs and so much to be grateful for uh, amidst all the the tragedy and loss and all the other kind of crazy things that that may come our way. And, you know, this morning was kind of another reminder of of that, where for our, our ministry, you know, we've been doing this whole dating course for Christian singles and all this build out, and we've been trying to, you know, work with this marketing professional to... Uh, really build out like the the sales page and the email sequences and you know all the kind of marketing stuff and uh, he's really been just basically MIA for the last like month he's you know not he, he when he does respond to an email it's super short and completely unhelpful and uninformative and and uh, you know the last month and a half and it's just been like you know, so, so much slower than, you know, we thought it was going to be and to the point where finally, you know, after several of these kind of unanswered and unresponded to emails this past month, month and a half or so, just kind of emailed him and say, hey, Rashal, and he's in India. We're like, hey, Rashal, like, you know, we just, we just need a response. We just need to make a decision. Like, we're a ministry <laughs> that has, you know, very little funds. We do not have all the time in the world. We have to get things going, and we just need to know, like, if you're still with us, or or if we should move on, and uh, you know, just try to really be patient with it too. Even though it's like, okay, time to step up and get some decisions made here. And he finally responded uh, this morning when I woke up. I had an email from him, and he said, you know, I'm so sorry uh, for the the lack of response and the lack of communication, but my son, who's probably like five or six or seven, somewhere in that neighborhood, eight maybe, uh, and has been battling a heart condition, and he recently passed away. Oh. And, you know, that's just one of those reminders of, like, why, and the, the lessons that I've learned and the stuff that I've taught over the years of just being curious with people rather than going in with such certainty and going in with more questions rather than bold statements because you just never know what might be going on for people. You know, it could be a situation where it's a marketer that's completely dropped the ball and that they're just kind of over it and they got their money and they're, they're done and you got to move on and that, that sucks. Uh, or it could be a marketer who's going through that and, and been losing his son slowly over the last several years, if not, and then expedited the last couple months and then passed away. So it certainly puts things into perspective as we, you know, start our Tuesday morning. And just to reflect on even as, as crummy as things can be going, that there's still plenty to be grateful for. And it's the, the true test of like, even in the midst of crazy circumstances and, and crazy issues, you know, can I still reflect on the goodness of God? And, and that's the, the challenge of even in health issues and health battles and, you know, depression or whatever it may be that, that's on, you know, job loss, divorces is that you know where can I still find the goodness of God in all of this and if I'm struggling to find the goodness of God it's because my perspective is so is is too narrow <clears throat> and is, is too short-sighted and that's that whole idea of you're merely seeing things from a human point of view and not from God's point of view and to be able to zoom out a little bit and to, to share and speak over the things that we're so grateful for and so thankful for and to just go through our lives as a little thankfulness and gratitude audit of all the things that God has saved us from, kept us from, helped us avoid that we don't even know he's helped us avoid, and, and to really put things into perspective. And so anyway, I just wanted to, to share that because it was so fresh and, and such a kind of another eye-opener as far as the, the life that we're living down here, where sickness and disease and illness is rampant, and disappointment and loss, you know, it runs around like crazy, but yet we, we have the hope of glory and that we have a bigger perspective, we have a bigger way of life, and that's why these kingdom principles are so pivotal to maintaining a kingdom mindset and why I'm so passionate about these kingdom principles and about this kingdom mindset that we're going to be going through because it really helps you to remain grounded. 
that when you come back to those principles of it's not about my kingdom, it's about God's kingdom. So even when your kingdom seems to be falling apart or when you're, <clears throat> you, know, you get looked over for a job that would have advanced your kingdom, is that you're able to put things into perspective that it's not about my kingdom anyway. It's about God's kingdom. That you know, it's not about my will being done because I am short-sighted and I do have uh, a desire for more immediate gratification that perhaps jeopardizes God's will over for my will. And that it's not about just this life. It's about eternal life. And I can't get so caught up in the day-to-day -day of these things when there's a whole eternity that we're looking forward to and that we're coming to. And so those were the first three principles that we talked about. And then we've got two more that we're going to talk about today out of a total of seven. So this will be four and five, and we'll get to six and seven next week. And then after that, the following Tuesdays, we're going to look at, okay, now if we have built our lives and our minds and centered our, our thoughts on these principles, how does that then change everything in terms of our perception, our thoughts, our emotions, our body reactions, and our behaviors, and how that then transforms not just our world, but the world as we walk and engage in it and live like Christ through it. So that's so, so huge in, in, in terms of our ability to do that. And so with these, <clears throat> what we're looking at today is uh, number four, that it's about intimacy with Christ, that it's about knowing Christ. Again, even this idea, I was just reading a, a commentary the other day that that verse of to love the Lord your God with all your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love the Lord your God with all your heart, that idea of the heart wasn't just the, the centerpiece of emotion, but the, the word heart in the Hebrew language was actually your, your thoughts and in your mind. So it's to fix your thoughts on God and to center your thinking around him. And this is how we do this with these kinds of principles, to center our thinking around him. So it's about intimacy with Christ. And what does that exactly mean? So last Tuesday, we finished with that it's about eternal life, not this life. And we talked about John 17, 3. They said, now this is the way to eternal life. Is that it was pointing in the direction of where we should have our, our eyes fixed on eternal life. And it said, this is the way to eternal life, that they may know you, the one true God in Jesus Christ. So the way to eternal life is to know him. Not to just know of him, but to truly know him. And that's a big, big difference is that you can say you know of LeBron James, but it's a whole different thing if somebody were to say, no, I know LeBron James. Or any celebrity or any kind of big personality. is like we're not impressed if somebody's like, oh, I know of LeBron James. Nobody's like, oh my gosh, you know of LeBron James? You gotta be kidding me. You know of him? What? Like, sit down, let's talk. But if somebody were to say, like, no, I know LeBron James. I know him personally. I have a personal relationship with him. That person, you'd be like, well, let's sit down and talk. <laughs> like, I got to hear some stories. So and think about how much more on a scale of magnitude when we're talking about LeBron James, the King James of basketball versus the, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords that is Jesus Christ to say that we would know him and that he would even extend us that opportunity <laughs> to extend us that kind of, of an openness that he doesn't owe us that to be able to know him. He's God. Like He doesn't owe us anything. And yet he's extending this invitation to know him. And yet so many people take that wildly for granted. I mean, think about on a typical Sunday morning at a church that does some sort of altar call at the end. And a lot of, you know, a lot of churches don't even do the altar call at the end. And, and those that do, you know, sometimes it's, you know, with all heads down and all eyes closed, like if you want to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, you know, raise your hand. And we're just going to ask you to put it up for a second and then kind of put it back down or check that box on your Connect card to say that you've accepted Christ. But we never actually take the opportunity to follow up on that immediately to say, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, like, let's talk. We have lunch waiting for you. 
Imagine that person saying, I've accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of my life, that he has paid the penalty for all of my sin, that he has cleansed me white as snow, that he has given me access to eternal life, that he is willing to impart heaven into me as a result of this decision, and then say, let's grab, uh, but I'm, I'm busy. I've already got plans. Imagine if somebody came to you and let's say you've got a, a home with a you know seven or eight hundred thousand dollar mortgage, and somebody you've just kind of purchased this home, you've just acquired the you know massive debt, or maybe you've had it for a decade of you know seven hundred thousand dollars on this this debt, and somebody comes and says, you know what, I'm going to pay, I want to cover and I want to pay for your mortgage, seven hundred thousand dollars, done deal. It's now yours completely free hey, do you want to grab lunch? Can you imagine that person saying, thank you, but actually I have plans. Thank you for paying off my mortgage, 700000 oh my gosh. So you're going to make the check out to Ryan Montague. And if you could hurry though, because I got plans. Like that just sounds utterly foolish. Or like, are you telling me if somebody paid your seven hundred thousand, you you cancel every plan that you had for that day? Be like, those fools can wait. I don't care who you had plans with. You'd be like, they're gonna understand. They'll get it. They're gonna be okay. I am making all of my priority and focus to this person that just paid off my massive, incomprehensible debt, and I'll spend the whole day with this person, getting to what to know them what on earth made you do that who are you like what is going on here you'd stop everything dead in your tracks to get to know that person and so again how much more significant is this on a spiritual realm that we're talking when we can recognize human worldly examples and understand and comprehend how significant this stuff is but then when we put it into spiritual significance it's like meh because we're merely seeing things from a human point of view not from God's point of view that's why I keep coming back to that Matthew verse where Jesus points out get behind me Satan for you're a dangerous trap to me I mean, we can see how crazy of a dangerous trap that is to merely see things from a human point of view and not from God's point of view. And this is what the Apostle Paul got in full measure, more than anybody else. He understood the significance of this, having gone from persecuted Christians, holding coats while Stephen is being stoned, getting a license to throw every Christian that he can find in prison and jail and subject them to persecution and, for, and probably more and more stonings. And yet he gets radically saved and turned around. And that's where this kind of an apostle and follower and disciple says in Philippians 3, 7 through 9, he says, I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I can gain Christ and become one with him. When he's talking about everything, he's talking about everything. He's talking about his own personal reputation. He's talking about his past career and livelihood and work and education. He's talking about his Roman citizenship, his Jewish born status, his family of origin, he literally is talking about all the things that are so near and dear to him, but also so near and dear to us that are so ridiculously hard to give up. And again, I'm not trying to make it sound like any of this stuff that we're talking about and any of these principles are remotely easy. Is that this is hard, hard stuff. Otherwise, everybody would be doing it and everybody would be living this way. And unfortunately, that's just not anywhere close to the reality when you look at the body of Christ and you look at the churches filled with, with Christians. And then in Colossians chapter 1, 9 through 10, we read this. It says, you know, we ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then the way you, will, then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord. 
and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while, you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. Is that the nice thing is, is that even if you live to the ripe old age of 90 with good mental capacity and good health, we are serving and following an infinite God that you can never know fully and completely. Is that we're always going to be able to read the Bible over and over and find new and new treasures every single time that we do. Is that my grandfather-in-law was a missionary to Africa, throughout Africa, uh, for 50 years with him and his wife. And he was originally reading the Bible once a year, and then he started stepping it up to four times a year. And I think at last count, you know, he read the Bible, you know, like 150 times throughout his life. And yet thinking about even on the 150th time, there was something that, that blew his mind. And I had the opportunity before he passed to sit and talk with him. And I asked him, you know, this is a guy that's read the Bible like 150 times. So I asked him, I was like, I was like, man, like, what's your, like, what's your favorite verse of the Bible? Thinking he's going to drop some sort of gem on me that I have completely missed coming from a guy that's read this thing indeed, you know, 150 times. I'm like, I'm like, I got like my notepad pen. I'm ready to receive this verse that's about to change everything this nugget i'm like this has got to be an old testament coming from a guy like this i'm not even going to bother with the new testament we're talking to this missionary you know he's going old testament and so he says to me he thinks about it for us for a minute and he says john 3 16 <laughs> in like a weird way i was like oddly disappointed i was like yeah john 3 16 okay and, but it was, but that also was just kind of a crazy revelation of a guy that's read the Bible 150 times, yet John 3.16 and the simplicity of it, that God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, that whoever would believe in him would have eternal life and not perish. Which is crazy. This guy that, that knew him so intimately and knew the word, and that's part of it, is knowing, knowing Christ, intimacy with Christ comes through reading the word of God. It comes through other things like prayer and service, and, and you can go, and go down the line. But the number one way is reading and engaging with the Word of God, which is why it's so crazy that so many Christians take reading the Word of God for granted. And I'll you know, never forget what a student told me. I was talking to her after class, and, and I had kind of brought up reading, the, reading the, the Bible, and she had said that she had recently started reading the Bible. And she said, you know what did it for me was that I was talking with a non-Christian friend of mine and that uh, non-Christian friend of mine asked me if I had read the Bible, you know, if I had read the entire Bible. And she said I had to be honest and tell her that I hadn't, that I had read portions of it and I had heard a lot of sermons, but I hadn't read the whole thing start to finish. And her non-Christian friend said, well, it's, I just find it so interesting because I've asked other Christian friends and none of them have read the whole Bible. She said, you know, it, it just kind of surprised me because I figured if you were going to dedicate your whole life to it, you would have at least read it once. And she said, when she said that, it just convicted me like crazy. And because that's that place of intimacy and knowledge of Jesus Christ is that in John 1, it says, in the beginning, the word already existed. The word was, was with God and the word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. And that's why you know I've quoted Dan Muller before on this of saying that you know you don't read the Word of God to to get through it; you read the Word of God to become it. Is that it's so important to read to understand that reading the Bible and reading the Word of God, our goal isn't to be able to quote it; our goal is to become it. it doesn't matter how many verses you can quote. What matters is how many verses you become and becoming more and more like Christ from one degree of glory to another. Like that's the whole point and purpose. It's not to be able to sound sound cool, sound amazing. It's like how many verses can I become? And I'll be honest, you know, so why I take such thorough notes and have a Bible journal and all this stuff is because, you know, I stink at like remembering like the, the addresses for verses. Is that I know a lot of verses. I can't always you know, get those where, where it's at. 
and sometimes even you know <laughs> even still people come up and they'll be like oh man you know I was just reading you know Hebrews 11 8 and it was whoo and they're just going I was like I was like do tell what and what is Hebrews 11 8 shall we it's like not having all the, you know, it's, it's it's so much more important because I think sometimes people get it of like, I want to be able to quote. I want to be able to, you know, give these verses and drop these little nuggets. And it's like, yeah, that's great, but that's also the Pharisees could do that. The devil could do that. Like the big difference is the, the verses that we've become and owned and knowing that it's about intimacy and relationship with Christ. And I do want to talk about one last thing before we kind of move on to the second one for today. Which is that uh, one of the things that I, you know, I, I sometimes feel the need to address is this idea. I'm sure you all have probably heard it, the, the, the quote and kind of mantra of it's, it's not about religion, it's about relationship. <clears throat> and people love to say it's not about religion, it's about relationship. Well, being a college professor and you know, seeing a younger generation over and over who has grown up with hearing it's about religion, or it's not about religion, it's about relationship. They've grown up on this mantra. And what I've seen is that they have made their own relationship and are abandoning in droves the religion. And unfortunately, what they associate religion with is church, is the Bible, are things of that nature tithing accountability connectedness life groups it's like hey but i've got my personal relationship you told me it's about relationship not about religion so i've got my personal relationship and how can you dare push back on my relationship with with christ and that's where to me what's been so helpful is to realize that again what people's problem was with religion and that comes from a place of people's church hurt and all sorts of baggage and things. And I get that. I get the motivations of where it comes from. But we've also got to realize that, you know, religion is people's problem isn't with religion. It's with sin. It's with sinful people operating within religion. Because there's no getting around the fact that Christianity is a religion. It's like, and, and that's, you know, religion is just a teaching, instruction, boundaries, guidelines about faith and worship of God. And so one of the things that's so important to realize is that when you get away from, and just kind of understanding this, this connection that, that I have at the bottom of the page there is that religion minus relationship equals corruption. So when you have religion, but you don't have the relationship with Christ, the intimacy with Christ, it can easily lead to corruption, which is the power, the greed, the, you know, the influence and all that kind of stuff which is where most people's baggage comes from, which then produced the phrase, it's not about religion, it's about relationship. Uh, but also, there's a problem when you have relationship minus religion. When you have relationship minus religion, you get convenience. It's like a friends with benefits type of relationship with Christ, where there's no expectation and there's no boundaries, is that I can just kind of dip in, get what I want, and get out. But when we realize that religion plus relationship equals covenant, the covenant of God. And that's why Mark Batterson said in his book, All In, you only get a relationship with God on his terms. His terms is the word of God. His terms is the religion of Christianity. He said, you can take it or leave it, but you cannot change the rules of engagement. So you only get a relationship when you get that when you go about it God's way. And that's where we see in John, 2 John 1, 9, that says that anyone who, wonder, who wanders away from this teaching has no relationship with God. But anyone who remains in the teaching of Christ has relationship with both the Father and the Son. So how do we know if somebody has a relationship? So many people claim to have a relationship with God or have a relationship with Christ. Well, how can we be sure of that? Well, according to 2 John 1, nine, if they're wandering from the teaching of Jesus Christ and they're wandering from the teaching of the word of God, then that would be a clear indication that they are lacking in a relationship with the Son and with the Father. So this relationship and this intimacy is so huge in terms of the implication that it has, but we also have to realize that it's got to be in connection with the other elements of the word of God themselves. 
So intimacy with Christ is so critical to having a proper, healthy, well-rounded kingdom mindset that it's about relationship and that he's even afforded us that opportunity to get to know him and to become one with him and that we have the same spirit in us that raised Christ from the dead and that we have the hope of glory. So that's a critical component to this kingdom mindset and being centered in that relationship with Christ that then fuels all other relationships out of that one central relationship that's above all else. All right, so we're going to move on to number five. Principle number five, your value, worth, and dignity come from God, not people, possessions, or accomplishments. That your value, your worth, and your dignity come from these very things. And so this is, again, a huge monumental mindset shift when we can get out of that because the patterns of this world would say that I get my value, worth, and dignity from the people that I'm connected to, from the worldly relationships, from my LinkedIn connections, that it's not about what you know, but it's about who you know. And if I know the right people, then I can be influential. I can be successful. And, and, and it become, those relationships then get detoured because they become about you. And that's a, a huge critical component is that there's still a lacking when we're treating people in relationship that way. And that's why... You know, uh, Les and Leslie Parrott said that if you go into relationships lacking personal identity and value, then all you can bring to the table is neediness. And in that, you can't have a healthy, proper relationship with other people. Same thing with possessions. These possessions are going to give me status and importance and value in that. Or the accomplishments. In fact, I just took my son on Sunday to see the movie uh, Big George Foreman. And if you haven't seen it, you got to go see this movie. It's an amazing, amazing story of faith. And, and George Foreman's life, literally the transformation was this point number five. That before his whole life, he was trying to gain value, worth, and dignity by being the big man on campus. By beating people up and by gaining possessions and accomplishments. And the more possessions and accomplishments that he accrued... He felt like that's where his value, worth, and dignity was going to come from. But of course, as he learned on an epic scale, becoming the heavyweight champion of the world and one of the most famous people and all this wealth and all these accolades, that it was still, there was still an emptiness until he was radically transformed by Christ. And then it changed everything in his life. And so I highly recommend going to see that movie because it's amazing and it really puts this into perspective because when we have our value, worth, and dignity in Christ, that's the idea from Matthew 7 where Christ says to build your house on solid rock. The solid rock is your value, worth, and dignity in Christ and Christ alone. And that's it. And then when the rains come in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it's built on the bedrock but anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rain and the floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty, mighty crash. And that's what George Foreman realized. He had been, even though with all this worldly success and all these different ventures, it all was sand. It was all built upon the sand, and it came crumbling down rather than being built on the one true thing. And that's where we get, again, our, our value, worth, and dignity. How do we know this for sure? And we've got to be able to live by, by truth and live by the word of God. In Genesis 1.27, it says that we are made in the image of God, both male and female. We are made in his image. So first and foremost, being made in the image of God, we know that we have just innate value, worth, and dignity in that. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it uh, tells us that don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God. You don't belong to yourself for God bought you at a high price. You must honor God with your body. You were bought at a high price. So how do you know that you have value? Because you were bought at a high price. What's the high price? It's the original firstborn son. It's the dearly loved son of God himself. It was his blood, it was his life that we were bought with. And to put that in perspective, just imagine if somebody in an archaeological dig 
you know, came across the, the tomb of Jesus and came across the, the, the linen wrappings that had the blood and the DNA of Christ in that burial, if they found that tomb, if they found those rags if, with that, think about how much that would go for at an auction. I mean, priceless. People would be willing to pay astronaut, you know, everything to get a hold of that. So that's the value that we have on our life. That's the value that we have to own and really truly believe rather than trying to get our value, worth, and dignity through looks or athletics or academics or social status or social approval or social media following or number of likes or reputation, perfectionism, task accomplishment, promotion, positions, titles, romantic relationships, being needed, cleanliness in organization of your home or clothes or car, is that so many people seek out value, worth, and dignity. And I include that last one of even just like the cleanliness because a lot of times people are only doing as good as, you know, their home is organized. Or they're only doing as good as they're performing at the workplace. They're only doing as good as their last sales performance. They're only doing as good as their last prayer of healing. They're only doing as good. You can see that when we, we want to truly be able to say it is well with my soul and leave it at that. Because of Christ, it is well with my soul, period rather than it is well with my soul when I'm feeling fit and looking good. My team is winning. My GPA is 3.5 or higher. My social media posts are getting attention and likes. I'm able to do things perfectly. I have completely checked off to-do list. The, my, it is well with my soul when I get that promotion, when I have the position and title I deserve, when my significant other is catering to my love language when I'm needed by others, when I'm fixing others' problems, when the house is neat and tidy and in order, when fill in the blank. Is that, again, we, we sing all these songs, we say all these verses, and yet our lifestyles don't really reflect that. That's why sometimes, like, if our church is singing a song, and I'm, like, convicted, I'm like, I can't sing this. Like, there was one point, there was a song that was like, uh, I want to be tried by fire. I was like, I ain't singing that. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, I don't, I don't honestly feel like I'm prepared in my heart posture to genuinely sing that and mean it. So why would I sing that and just heap that kind of, you know, pressure on myself or whatever it is? It's like, no, I, and now I, I can sing that, but I couldn't at the time. And so there's certain verses and certain songs that we need to be far more cautious about to be like, hey, I don't want to just make this lip service. I want to, when I sing it, I want, to, I want to mean it. When I quote it, I want to be able to say that I mean it and, and reserve that kind of serious contemplation for what we're talking about here, to say that it is well with my soul, but then to live the contrary where you need X, Y, and Z, and you need all of these things in place, and you need these circumstances to look a very particular way in order for it to really actually be well with your soul. Like that's a totally different walk and, and lifestyle. So asking these questions of, do you need someone's love or approval for your value, worth, and dignity? Do you need to be needed for your value, worth, and dignity? Do you need to earn your way in the world for your value, worth, and dignity? And again, Dan Moeller has some pretty challenging words in this regard, and he's the one that really has pushed me immensely on this. And so if you do not want to be convicted... I would not recommend going and watching Dan Muller on YouTube. But he says, if you're being okay is dependent upon someone else treating you differently, then that's idolatry and Jesus isn't even Lord. And you're only as good as you're being treated rather than as good as Jesus is in you. All of a sudden, life is speaking louder than truth and you are no longer capable of accessing the power of God and you're letting something matter more than what matters most. Kind of added to that, this idea that as long as your value, worth, and dignity is intertwined with someone or something other than Christ, your emotions and mood are going to be up for grabs and blowing in the wind. Thus, you're letting your mood and your emotions and feelings determine your level of Christ-likeness rather than your Christ-likeness to determine your emotions and feelings and moods. And so that can happen so often is that, you know, it's awesome to, to feel God and to feel his presence 
and to have that emotional reaction to a worship song or reading the word or a time in prayer. But sometimes we, we glorify the feeling and it's like, well, I'm not feeling God right now. And therefore he feels so distant or where is he? And, you know, or I see a divine opportunity and a person I could pray for, or I could reach out for, but I don't feel the, the prompting. I don't feel like I should, should be doing, you know, I'm not, I don't have the feeling. And it's to say, well, you, then you need the truth. Is that the truth is that Christ says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And I will be with you to the end of this age. The truth is that we're to go out into all the world and to make disciples. And is that you don't, need a feel, you don't need to feel like you should pray for that person. You just need to know the truth of God's word that it never returns void and that we are called to pray for all people is that I've found that I've had far greater success in divine appointments and stepping out when I rely on truth rather than feelings. Because when I try to rely on the feelings of I need to feel the right thing and have the right sensation and then I'll step out, it, that rarely happens. Because there's always something that's going to dampen the, the emotion and the mood of the moment, whether that be the stress of work or it be you know, you know, parenting stuff or it be big decisions or you name it, we've always got a reason and a rationale and an excuse for why the feelings aren't there, but you will never have an excuse for why the truth and the presence of the word isn't there. And that's why we've got to have these anchoring thoughts that keep us wrapped up, grounded, and rooted in the deepness and fullness. And that's where it's so critical to know that your value, worth, and dignity is anchored in Christ. And so I want to give you one last final illustration, which is that uh, I don't have one on me, but I'll tell you this illustration, which I forget if I've done before. But uh, my father-in-law was, this was years ago, my father-in-law was, was preaching at a, a youth conference. And this is, we're talking decades ago. But he was at this big youth conference, and he was preaching, and he prepared this message and this sermon. And he's in the middle of this message, in this sermon at this youth conference, when he feels like, God is prompting him and kind of highlighting this one young woman in the crowd. And God is prompting him to kind of turn his direction, turn his preaching in a, in a new, new way. And so he kind of just opens up and he says, you know, trying to be open to the moment, open to the prompting and responsive to God. And says, give me what you want me to share. And in that moment, God reminded him of this illustration, this $20 bill illustration that he had heard uh, years ago from another person. And so he just so happened to have a $20 bill in his pocket, and he, and he takes out this $20 bill, and he holds up the $20 bill. And, you know, he says, how many of you here would want this $20 bill? And, of course, all their hands shoot up. So he crumples it up and then holds up this crumpled $20 bill and says, now how many of you would want this? Of course, all their hands shoot up. So he throws it down on the ground, and he begins to kick it around the stage. Now how many would want this? All their hands shoot up. So he stomps on it and, you know, twists it into the ground doing everything he can to this $20 bill. He picks it up and says, you know, now, how many of you would want this $20 bill? It's been crumpled up. It's been thrown down. It's been kicked around. It's been stomped on. How many of you would still want this? And, of course, all their hands still shoot up. So he goes to this one young woman in the, in the front and says, why? Like, why would you still want this $20 bill after all that it's been through, after all those things that have happened to it? And she says, well, because its value hasn't changed, I can still use it. And he says, that's it. That's it exactly. That's what God wants you to know, is that no matter what anybody has said to you, no matter what anybody has done to you, no matter your, how horrible your circumstances have been, that your value and worth and dignity never changes because it's anchored in Christ. And God can and will still use you no matter what has happened to you. And so he, he took the $20 bill and he wrote value, worth, and dignity on it, and he gave it to her. And then he ended up never seeing her. He didn't get a chance to connect with her or hear from her or anything. And then he said, two, like two decades later, I'm talking 20 years later, he's preaching in a similar part of this, this area of Pennsylvania. And uh, he gets done preaching the message, praying for people, and he sees this kind of really distinguished-looking woman in the back, just kind of waiting and waiting and waiting. And so finally he goes up and says, you know, hey, you know, how, how, can I help you? And she says, well, actually, you know, I... I heard on the radio that you were going to be preaching at this church, and I knew that I had to come and see you. She said, you're not going to remember me, but about 20 years ago, you preached this message with this $20 bill. And she said, what you didn't know is that at that time, I was going through, my parents were going through a horrible divorce. 
that my parent and I was caught in the middle of it and I went from being an A student to an F student I went from being the good kid in class to the troublemaker in class and constantly getting in trouble and I was just going through it but when you gave me that message I took that $20 bill home and I put it on my mirror at home and every morning when I woke up I looked at that $20 bill and it reminded me that I had value worth and dignity anchored in Christ and I just wanted to let you know that that changed my life and my life trajectory. And now, all these years later, I'm now the head pediatric surgeon at the hospital in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And so, as a part of our ministry, uh, our artist, Alex, who's come a couple times here, he created this $20 bill that has the line of the tribe of Judah <clears throat> in the middle, and it has the kingdom of God, and it has all these verses that we've been talking about that... that get at the, the value, worth, and dignity. And so I wanted to pass these out to each of you before you go. And yeah, that'd be great. So that you, we can all be reminded and that we can all be prepared to share this message with others to know that our value, worth, and dignity, part of our kingdom mindset has to be anchored and rooted in these verses and in this way. And if we get it twisted, then we're going to be, our emotions, our moods are going to be subject to change. Our lives are going to be up for grab. And we're never going to get around to walking in truth. 